of, uh, now you're going to have to probably, some of you may have to go to the table of contents, okay? And that's okay, all right? It's, it's good. To the book of Haggai. To the book of Haggai. And uh, minor prophet, major message. Um, we don't turn to these minor prophets, but uh, we'll go there. If you can find it, um, and then I'll make some introductory remarks, and uh, we'll get there in just a moment. I, uh, last week, we started a series, and today will be the last of this, because next week we have our Fan Sunday, and we're going to start a brand new series on the church. And uh, so we're, I'm super excited about that. We're going to all go through another membership class. That's what we're going to do together. I'm revamping the membership class totally, and uh, it's going to be great. So uh, anyway, we're going to all go back through a membership class. It's going to be awesome. It'll be fun. But um, I want to I want to talk to you about money today. Uh, last week, Pastor Stu Farley came and he taught about tithes, and I want to I want to build on what he has spoken about and go some different directions. But the enemy has got us so afraid in the church about talking about money. Uh, we're triggered. We're triggered. And it's triggered because of a, the hyper-prosperity gospel that's preached. I believe in prosperity. I believe God wants to prosper me. I believe God wants to help me. So if you want to de- deem me as a prosperity preacher, I would say, yes, I am. Now, I'm not a hyper-prosperity preacher, okay? Uh, and there's a lot difference. I believe the Bible teaches us that God wants us to prosper. God wants to help us in every area of our lives. But we're all triggered because of the abuses that's happened in the church, right? In the body of Christ. Uh, we've all saw some of the gimmicks and the things that's been said. You know, you, you know whether that you're more spiritual because you have a lot of money or, uh, you know, uh, you know the people wanting you to give all your money or those type of things. And uh, we could say a whole lot about that. But that's not what we're talking about here. But money is a big deal. It's a big deal to our lives. It's, it's, it, listen here, your life revolves around it. You got to have it, right? Uh, you work hard for it. You spend a lot of time getting it. So it has to be important. That's why God cares about it. You know, Jesus spoke about money more than he did anything. He did. 16 out of the 38 parables were concerned with money and possessions. Why so much? Why so much about money? Because it affects every area of our lives. And Jesus knew that money would be the one thing that man would trust over him. Right? And money reveals a lot about our hearts. You know, it's something we have to always be on guard. You know, I was thinking about, you know, you ever watched uh, some of these people, these uh, these, uh, lion tamers or these bear tamers, you know? I mean, they're, you know, these big old grizzly bears are slobbering all over them, you know what I'm saying? And, or they're t- these lions, you know, they'll get in there and pet them. But you know what? They're always aware that they're still a wild beast. And it's the same way with our money. We need to handle it. We don't need to be scared about it. But we need to be understand. We need to understand, right? That this thing could get dangerous and could get wild on me and really harm me. And that's really the whole thing about us and money. So Jesus talked about money. Now, let me say this to you. Christians in America have more money available to them today than ever. It's statistically proven. Um, but the giving is less in the church. Not, not in this church in particular. I'm just saying across the body of Christ, the giving is less. Giving less to the church, nonprofit organizations. The average, the average giving amount per church goer, listen to this now. The average giving amount per churchgoer is $17 a week or $884 per year. This is stats. You can go look it up. Not right now. Tithers or tithers represent about 10 to 25% of all congregations. Okay? 10 to 25%. Christians donate 2.5% of their income to churches. Only 1% of households making over 75000 contribute with tithing amounts of at least 10% of their income. During the Great Depression, they gave a higher share of 3.3%. So during the toughest time, probably we would ever say in this world, right, they were giving more than the church statistically. The average income of West Virginians is $75,856. Right? That's the average income. Right? So you can do the math. A tithe off of that would be what? $7,500. 
So listen, this is the point, is that this church is a great giving church. So this is not about because we're, we're struggling here. I'm telling you this because if you don't watch out, because the world is very self-centered. And it's very self-focused. And it's becoming more of that. And if you don't watch out, you'll get sucked in. And the next thing you know, your giving goes down the drain. You want to keep God involved in your finances. Amen? Keeping God involved in your finances. Praise the Lord. You got to look at your face up here sometimes, you know? Especially when I'm talking about your money. Haggai chapter 1, you there? Let me give you a little content, content, context here of what's going on. Uh, Haggai is a contemporary of Zechariah. He's a contemporary of Ezra. And they're building, they had been building the temple. Remember now they were in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. They went back, right, and started rebuilding the wall. Remember the Nehemiah? Remember that, right? Rebuilding the wall. Well, that wall was the first thing they needed to build, but they needed to rebuild the temple, right, because it had been ransacked and destroyed. So Ezra and the people of God began to build the temple. Well, they got opposition when they were building that temple, and they took about a 15-year sabbatical from it, from building. And all of a sudden now, Haggai now begins to prophesy to stir the people of God back up to, be, to do what they need to do, to be a part, because they had, they had 15 years, they had walked away from the temple, and now he's stirring them back up. To begin to do, to do what they need to do to get this temple built. Let's start here in verse 2. Thus, thus speaks the Lord of hosts saying. That this people says the time has not come. The time, that the, Lord, the, the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying. It is time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses. And this temple to lie in ruins. Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts. Consider your ways. So he said listen it is time. You're living in beautiful homes. But the temple of God is in ransack. It's, 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 it's in ruins. we got to start building again. He said, he said that in verse 5. He said, what? Consider your ways. Everybody say that. Consider your ways. That's what I want to talk about today. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. Now look what it says. You've so much and you bring in little. You eat but don't have enough. You drink but you are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, what's he say? Consider your ways. Consider your ways. So Haggai was encouraging the people. Consider your ways. He said, listen, the temple is lying in ruins. You need to begin to do what you need to do. Begin to give and begin to help build the temple again. He said, man, you're earning wages. All this stuff, you're sowing, you're not reaping anything. You're you're earning wages, but it's like putting money in a bag and it's going out the other side. Has anybody ever felt like getting their finances before? He says, consider your ways. They weren't involved in the work of God, and it was causing problems in their lives. We don't want to be people that that, that are, you know what, we enjoy our pleasures and our paneled houses and our homes, but the the, the church and, and the gospel and the kingdom of God begins to suffer because the money's not there. Well, praise the Lord. Any time, and this is why I'm telling you this, any time you lose sensitivity, sensuality follows. I want you to hear this. Any time you lose sensitivity of something, sensuality follows. Sensuality, what is, the Bible would call that the flesh. It would call unruled and unbridled emotions. It's a pursuit of pleasures. Focusing on living according to the flesh and emotions and actions not submitted to God and not the spirit. That's what he's talking about. He said, listen, you've lost sensitivity. And he says this word consider, right? Consider. Consider your ways. That word consider in the Hebrew actually means it's not just a passing thought. It's actually, I need you to get to the root. This is what it means. It, get to the root level. Get down here at the heart and find out why you've done this. He's not just talking about consider, well, I'm just thinking. No, no, he said, listen, I need you to pause. I need you to think about it. I need you to dig down at the heart level and find out what's going on, why this is not happening. 
Consider your ways. There was a problem at the heart level. You know, Jesus said that, right? For where your treasure is, what did he say? There your what? Your heart will be also. Wherever your treasure is, your heart will be there. All I got to do is be around you five minutes and I can tell you what's on your heart. You get around somebody 15 or 20 minutes, you'll find out what they've been looking at. You'll find out where they've been investing their time. You'll find out what's going on. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Pastor John, they set you up front. They set you up front for a reason because I paid them a lot of money and said, listen, set that guy up there front right there. I need some amen. <laughs> God is interested in your heart, not your money. I want you to hear me. And this is not some money-grubbing preacher up here. I'm trying to teach you something because why? I want you to consider your ways because I'm tired of seeing people have their money in a bag and it going out the other end. So money reveals our heart. You know, they look at your credit score. Well, before you can ever go get a loan, they'll, they'll, they'll look at your what? Your credit score. Because the way that you handle your finances and the way that you handle your life reveals to them if they can actually trust you. Whether they can trust you with this. We live in a world full of selfishness. So money speaks much about ourselves. If we don't consider our ways, well, our money will actually turn into, from a blessing into a curse. So the people of God had forgot about taking care of the needs of the temple and the people. Why? Because the temple was the center of Jewish life. It was the place the presence of the Lord was. It was the place where they encountered God. You've got to watch. And I know you guys have heard me teach on finances before. But I always use this and I, and I want to use it again. But you've got to guard yourself against cirrhosis of the giver. Cirrhosis is something that attacks a person's liver. And it hardens the liver. Cirrhosis means heart, it's a hardening. And you've got to protect yourself against a hardening of heart. You understand that, right? I don't know what you've been taught about money and churches. But if the enemy can convince you of anything, it's everybody wants your money. And, they, and, 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 and this person is going to be rich and you're going to be poor, whatever. The majority, 98%, 99% of the people that's teaching this, it's not like that. Come on, somebody. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So if we fail to keep God involved in our finances, we're going to find the devourer having access to our finances. All of a sudden, the money starts to, why? I've got to get God involved. Malachi 3, will a man rob God, right? The thing is, is that he says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. The enemy would come in and start devouring your finances. You've got to get it right on the money. Because Jesus talks about it. Jesus said, listen, money tells me a lot about a person's heart. Tells me a lot what he can trust us with. Do you know why God trusts us a lot in this church? It's because of faithful givers just like you that have done what God has called them to do over the years. No one builds a $1.486 million building next door and able to be able to pay $700,000, over $700,000 down to make that thing $720,000 that you finance. That ain't done because, it ain't, it ain't because of me, it's all, it's us. It's all of us. And you just do your part. You do. You guys have done this over the years, so I'm not teaching this because I think this is going to... I hope it does stir somebody up to give more or to do something. I hope that happens for you. But at the end of the day, we've been a church that's been very strong. I sat in a meeting with pastors uh, two weeks ago in Plano, Texas, around a round table with over 80-some pastors. They broke us up into 10 people, and it was an amazing time. And I went there, and there was some things. They was talking about budgeting and this. And I just said, well, you know, I never had, we never had a problem with money in our church. And the pastors looked at me like a cat, like a look at I said, no, we've never just had, I mean, 
I've never had the issues. I'm not saying I won't. I'm just saying I've never had it. Because why? Because you guys have done this. You've, you've took a hold of the word of God and you've considered your ways. And you've considered your ways. As a church, we provide programs. We provide a place for people to come to. This is a facility. Everybody say facility. Facility. Facilities what? Facilitate. What's this building next door? It's about facilitating. I'm facilitating something. What are we trying to facilitate? People can experience God. They can find family. They can follow Jesus. We want to help people do these four things every single week, all the time. We want people to experience God, find family, follow Jesus, and then go make a difference. That's what we, and that's what this is all about. And we're trying to facilitate that. We got to consider our ways. We got to consider our ways. Now, consider your money ways. Let me get this real quick. So, considering your money ways, number one, keep God first. Keep God first. Honor the Lord. Proverbs 3 9 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your, all your increase. Honor the Lord with your possessions. Put God and keep God first in your life. Matthew 6, You guys know this. Seek ye first the what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be what? Added unto you. The enemy wants us out of alignment. If, now this is not just in finances. This is anything. I mean, I mean let's, let's just make it. The enemy wants your life out of alignment. Because if he gets your life out of alignment, there's a lot of pain and struggle that comes with that. That's what the enemy wants. He wants you to get you off balanced. He wants to get you out of alignment. That way he can take advantage of you. That way he can start causing pain and suffering. That's why when a person has a dislocated joint, the first, it's a, it, when someone dislocates their joint, it is an emergency, it is an emergent situation. They need to get that joint back into place very quickly because it will cut off the blood supply, if it's, if it's, if it's, especially if it's dislocated wrong. Putting that thing back into alignment. I've saw, you know, back when I was a nurse, I remember people coming in with broken hips. They, they had broken hips. And the, and the thing is, they would sit there and their body, listen, your body knows what alignment is. It's why it goes into, it's why it goes into spasm. Why it's trying to, it's saying something's wrong here and it's trying to pull things back into alignment. I'm not talking about, I'm just not talking about money. I'm talking about anything. Listen to what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you. But they go and they put pressure and they put them in traction until they can get it fixed. They put them in traction or they put pressure on it, right? In order to relieve that spasm. This is the point. Listen here. When things get out of alignment, there's pain. But when the Lord comes and starts dealing with you and starts putting a little pressure on you, don't walk away from the pressure. It's actually going to help you in the long run. Keeping God first. The scripture... The scripture it's telling us if we keep God first, the byproduct is alignment. We have to settle the lordship issue with our money. If I have to say anything, we got to settle the lordship issue with my money. That's, that's what i got to do. Faith in Christ as Savior is different than the submission of Christ as Lord. Let me say this again. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about anything. But we're talking about money. Faith in Christ as Savior is different than submission to Christ as Lord. There's people that's given their life to Jesus, but Jesus is not the Lord of their lives. He's not calling the shots. The reason we waver with finances, check this out now. The reason we waver so much with finances, whether to give or not to give, is because we've not settled the lordship issue. Because once I decide to do something... The lordship issue now, it, the, it, right, I've, I've done become persuaded and I can't get shaken off of it. And when you're talking about timing, you guys in the rock, you need to listen to this, man. This is, this is the way, this is the way. I'm, I'm trying to teach you the way. I don't care if it's a dollar, I don't care if it's ten dollars. It doesn't matter. Start doing something and giving to God. I'm not doing, listen, this is not for my benefit, this is for you. I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. 
This is for you. This is for you. So money wants to lord over your life. Money wants to lord over our lives. It's a terrible master. It's a great servant. Stay with me. We find ourselves today, and especially in people's lives, in deep debt because we fail to settle the lordship issue. We're investing our money in stuff we don't need to be investing in. Do you really need that? Do you really need this? That's just going to put me deeper in debt. It's going to cause me more pain and struggling. And it's going to keep me uh, being servant right to, 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 the, to the lender. It's going to cause me problems and pain. But we do it because why? We've lost this. We've got sensuality going on. It's feeding our flesh. It has great pleasure. It feels good. And if it feels good, then you know what? That's what I want. This is the world we live in. So we have to watch. I read this. It says, the story is told about a clever salesman who closed hundreds of sales with this line. Ready? Let me show you something several of your neighbors said you can't afford. Well, I'll prove him. I'll prove him. Because we're trying to always live up to somebody else's expectation instead of one person's expectation, and that is him. I'm not against you having stuff. I have stuff. You have stuff. We all have stuff. But I'm going to set up the lordship issue. And I'm going to put God first. But that may mean that I may have to say no to something else. Are you willing to do that? Because I just found out something. If I do what God tells me to do, the stuff that I actually... It ends up finding its way to me anyway. So it, all of a sudden, it just, whoop, there it is. God's God, man. I've gave money and seen return within two weeks. I've sowed seed and seen return within months. I've saw God do things through my finances. I told you the story about the God, when God told me to sow a watch. I know I've told this story, but it's a testimony of mine. Two weeks, and this, uh, the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to buy this person a watch. And I bought him a Garmin watch. $150 watch. Bought it for him. God told me to do it. Gave the money. Or I gave the watch to him. Bless him. Bless this, bless this, this young man. Bless him tremendously. Within two weeks, I had somebody walk into my office. Now like, listen. Walk into my office and sit down and said, you know what? I was praying. The Lord told me to give you $1,500. So I'm writing the check. Here it is. Don't ask me any questions. I'm out. <laughs> now, now hold on. Hold on. I gave 150. No, I, listen. This ain't about you getting stuff. But listen, this is the thing though. I'm not just, I do it because I'm being obedient to God. And God takes care of the rest. Right? I can believe God. God cares about my finances. But he wants me to put him first and don't let money master over you. Because it's a terrible master. It's a terrible master. Luke chapter 16. Go there with me real quick here. Can I get a good amen? All right. Smile. I'm talking. You act like you're having a colonoscopy this morning or something, you know. Dear Lord. Is it hot in here or is it just me? Praise the Lord. Somebody said it. Freezing. Freezing. Give me a break. <laughs> Luke 16. A very interesting set of scripture. But I want to start in verse 9 and we'll go down to verse 13. And there's a lot to say, but I want to reference one passage, a part of this scripture. And I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous, unrighteous mammon. You see that word? You got to pay, pay attention, mammon. That when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Man, this is good. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve what? Two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what? Now, many translations put this down as money. And they're not wrong. 
It, it does mean wealth and riches. But Jesus uses the word mammon for a reason. It's more than material things. It's more than money. Mammon, it's an Aramaic word. I don't want to bore you, but listen to this. It's an Aramaic word, and it's a reference to the Syrian deity of God, the God of riches and wealth. Mammon is the deity of money and wealth. Jesus personifies mammon, not as a thing, but as a, a, a being. So what they would do, now listen, and they, they, what's cool about it is that these, who was he talking, let's ask, who's the audience that Jesus is talking to? What would be, what would be their, who would be, the, who would be talking to? Come on. Who are they talking to? The Jews. They knew all about their history. They knew they were in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. These people here weren't, but they knew all about their fathers. One of the top eight deities in the, in the Babylonian empire was mammon. And Jesus uses the word mammon and personifies it as a master. They would even sacrifice their children to be blessed financially. See, this is the deal. Money's amoral. It's what spirits on the money. Everybody in this room, there's a spirit on your money. There's a spirit, the spirit of God or the spirit of mammon. There's a spirit on your money. And the way that you, listen, when you give, you tithe, you're doing, you're getting God involved in your finances. There's a spirit on that. Jesus said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You know, people say, well, I have, you know what, I, I don't believe in all that tithing stuff. And that's all blah, 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 blah. Well, let me tell you something. You know the reason that you want that, don't want that to happen? You know why? It's not because you want to give more money. It's because you want to give less. Let's be honest. Because New Testament tithing and giving, listen, it's, I guarantee you it's more than 10%. Because we serve, we're in a better covenant. With better promises. Amen. Amen. I'm just telling you. Listen, if we got a problem with giving, it's because it's not because of the preacher and it's not because of the church. It's you know what it is? It's a heart issue that's going on. Yeah. Amen. There's something going on at the heart level. It's a lordship issue. Are you enslaved to money today? This is my question. You cannot serve God and mammon. Check this out. This is the only place that God contrasts himself with another spirit. <laughs> what do you say? Because why? Because it, mammon promises us happiness. It promises joy. It, it promises significance and peace and love. But it's all a false promise. M Mammon can't give you any of that. Only God can give you that. You don't, have, you don't have to have a dime to your name and be the happiest person in the world. You don't have to have a dime to your name and have peace and joy and love. You don't have to have a dime to your name. The answer to life problems is, why if I just had more money? Probably not. Because if you had more money, guess what you'd do? More problems. And if you can't, listen, this is the problem. If you can't steward it well, it don't matter how much money you got. Go with me to First Timothy real quick. You guys all right? All right. Praise the Lord. God's good. All the time. All the time he's good. 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul here writing to Timothy, and he says this in verse 6. He says, now godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and certain we can carry no what? Hearses don't pull you hauls.
And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Now look what he says. But those who desire to be what? See, our desire should never be rich. Our desire is for God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. But those who desire to be rich, nothing wrong with rich. Right? The problem is we demonize people because they have money. It's because you're jealous. People, I mean, I worked in the hospital for years, of course, and you know, people, well, there's no money grabbing doctors, blah, blah, blah. Do you know how much time that they have spent in school to fix your broken arm? To fix your brain? To fix your heart? Come on, somebody. See, we got to break out of the poverty mentality, see. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And the enemy and many foolish and harmful lusts which draw, drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10, for, now you've all heard this, well you know sir, that the money is the root of all evil. Well that's not what it says. Money is not the root of evil, it's the what? The love of it is the root of all evil. Why is it the root of all evil? It's not about the money. It's about the selfishness that's attached to the money. That's the root of all evil. What got, listen, what got Adam and Eve into trouble is because they begin to think, listen, I'll do it my way. I'll do it how I want to do it. The root of all evil is selfishness and pride. Money just exposes it. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed away from the faith, look here now, out of alignment, in their greediness, and pierced themselves through with what? Because of the selfishness. Not because of the money. It's because someone didn't know how to handle the money. And then he goes in, but you, old man of God, flee these things, but you pursue, you desire righteousness, and godliness, and faith, and love, and patience, and, and gentleness. If you go down to verse 17, look what he says. Command those who are rich. Now, he's not, he's not, calling, them, he's not calling them evil. He's not, he, he's not, he's not, he said, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly, what? All things to what? Enjoy. Let them do good with their finances. Let them be rich in good works. Don't just give, but also be a person that's rich in good works. Get it all together. Ready to give and willing to share. He's not, listen, God's not against us having money. He's he's against money having us. Can I get a good amen there? Hallelujah. So this is real important. This is real important. Now, you say, well, pastor, you just want my money. No, 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 no. I want you to be blessed. Listen, listen here. I I just, I want you to be blessed. I want you, God, I want God involved in your finances that way that hole gets, gets sewed up. That we can, we can lay up treasures in heaven. That you and I can do something for the kingdom of God bigger than ourselves. And, and we can see people saved and set free and come into freedom. That's what, it's going to take that. I know, because listen, I, I, I talk to pastors in our area. Some of them don't have two cents to rub together. All of a sudden, a need comes up to the school. What would it be like for me if we couldn't do that? But we can. I'll make friends with the unrighteous mammon. I'll make friends with him. We will. Can I get a good amen here? Okay, so let me show you this. First Kings, okay, put it up on the screen real quick. We've got to move. First Kings chapter 17, verse 8. Now, this is the Elijah, right? God sends Elijah to a poor woman. There's a drought in the land, a drought in the land. He just, he's been fed with, uh, by the ravens, by the brook chairs. The Bible says that. And as in the word of the Lord came to him saying, look what it says here. Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. 
and she was going to get it. And he called her, to her and said, please, hey, make me some bread too. <laughs> Pretty bold. I mean, you're in a drought. The lady, you know, she's, right? Uh, so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in the bin. See, you, you can't focus on what you don't have. You've got to focus on what you do have. What's in your house? And a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my son that we may eat it and what? Now, this is the person that God sends Elijah to, a poor woman. Why would he do that? Why did he send him to a rich woman? Verse 13, and Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake. Not just bread, just go ahead and make me some cake. <laughs> put, a little, put, a little, put a little topping on that. You know. And bring it to me and after make some, of your, some for yourself and your son. Verse 14, thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jewel of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her, and her household ate for what? Now, this is the point. This is the point. Why did God send Elijah to a, to a poor woman? Because God wanted to provide for her. God, the reason God wants you to be a giver, he wants to provide for you. So he said, the way that I can do this is by actually getting her to respond and give to the man of God. And it kicked in on the other side. Isn't that good? You've got to settle the lordship issue. You gotta settle the lordship issue. Number two, it's a part of our discipleship. I'm gonna move quickly. Giving is a spiritual discipline that needs a part of the rhythm of a disciple. Why? What is a disciple? A disciple is a follower of Christ. A disciple is someone that's that's being made and formed into the image of God's dear Son, according to Romans chapter 8. That you and I are in a process of sanctification to look more like Jesus every single day. And God is a giver. So when we are giving, we're actually reflecting the heart of our Father. And it's actually a part of our discipline. The number one problem in people's lives today is selfishness. So our, our history reveals our hearts to God. It reveals our hearts to God. John D. Rockefeller, you ever heard that name before? John D. Rockefeller? He didn't have, he didn't have very much money, did he? He said this, I, would have, I never would have been able to tithe the first million dollars I ever made if I had not tithed my first salary, which was $1.50 per week. It's got to become a rhythm of your life. Money's a test. I didn't say it to him. God uses money to test us. God, you know, God does test you. He'll never tempt you. Temptation and test are two different things. Temp temptation's from the enemy. Testing is from God. And God will test our hearts. All right, you say tithe. Tithe. Ten. Ten. Right? Ten. Ten. What's, what's the word tithe mean? It means ten. Ten. The number ten is the number of testing in the Bible. How many times did God test Pharaoh's heart with the plagues? Ten. God tested Israel in the wilderness. Ten times. How many times was Jacob's wages changed? Ten times. How many days was Daniel tested? Ten days. How many virgins were tested in Matthew 25? Ten. Ten is the number of testing. Ten is the number of testing. And God tests us. He wants us to, he wants to test our heart. Can I trust you with this? Can I trust you with this? Luke chapter 16, Marianne, real quick on the screen. Luke chapter 16, we read it a minute ago. There in verses 10 through 12. Luke 16, verses 10 through 12. She'll get her up. He who is faithful... In what is the least, now he's talking right above us about a steward and stewarding over the master's finances and his possessions, being a steward. He goes down, he says, listen, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in what another man's, listen, your finances belong to you anyway, it belongs to God. 
Your kids belong to God. Your home belongs to God. Your car belongs to God. It all belongs to God. Amen. He's the one that's given you power to get wealth. That's Deuteronomy 8. And if you've not been faithful in what another man, who will give you what's your own? Verse 13. He goes right on in right there. You could go, he said, that's when he says, no man can serve two masters. Right? You cannot serve God and you cannot serve mammon. You cannot serve riches and wealth and that spirit. You serve me. It's about faithfulness. Discipleship. Can God trust us with our money? Giving is the training wheels of the kingdom. It's the, it's the T-ball. It's the T-ball of the kingdom. You guys all right with me? What can God trust me with? If he gives you increase, can he trust you? You see, Listen, this happens a lot. We ask God to, to increase us, yeah. right? And it never happens. Do you ever think that might be a blessing and not a curse? Because just maybe God says, listen, if I give it to them, they'll squander it all and it'll cause them more pain. Can we trust God enough with that? Hey, God. I get it. I need to work on my stewardship. You know where you're at. You're never compelled. Listen, if you feel like today this message is coming from a place of trying to get you to give, then I don't, listen, don't give it all. Please. Please. It's not about that. It's about trying to get you into a place that you're working with God in your finances. Yes, are we going to be able to do what we need to do here? Absolutely. We're going to be able to pay this building off. Come on, let's believe God for $720,000 of debt cancellation going to happen here. I'm believing God that someone's going to come in here and say, listen, what do you need? I believe all of us are going to continue to do what we do and get this thing paid down in the next three to five years. Can you believe with me? Yes. Hallelujah. It can happen. It's going to happen. Because why? I know i got a lot of good people in this room that just do what God tells them to do. Whoo! You guys all right? It's a part of my discipleship. It's a part of my discipleship. You know, you can test God. The Bible says that in Malachi 3. He said, he said, test me with this. Test me with your finances. Just test me. Just test me. He said, I'll test you, but you test me. And see if I won't do for you what I'm telling you that I will do for you. See if I will not take care of you. I didn't promise you, I didn't promise you another big house. I didn't promise you some, some new newfangled car. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not, that's not, no, 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 no. I'm promising you, man, that you'll have, you'll have your need met, met and you'll have more than enough. You say, well, I'm not rich. Oh, yes, you are. Listen here, did you come in in a car today? Who all came in a car today? Who all came in a car today? Yeah, 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 you're rich. You're greater than most, I think it's about 98% of the world don't have a car. If you've got one nickel plus whatever, all your needs bet, and you've got an extra amount, you're rich. Well, they live a day on Haiti, in Haiti, Pastor John. How, how, many, how, how much money do they live in Haiti? In Haiti? How, much, how much do they make a day? <laughs> 250 a day. Do the math. We're rich. You're going to go out to eat. Who saw, who all, who, let's just, who's going out to eat afterwards? Come on, who's going to, who's going, oh, I saw this. Who's going out, come on, who's going out to eat? <laughs> Nobody wants to admit to it, do they? I ain't preaching on gluttony, man, come on. <laughs> you think I was preaching on that? But what I'm saying is you're going to sit down and someone's going to come to your table and they're going to take your order. And they're going to ask you what you want. And they're going to keep your glass full. That is a king. That's a king. And please tip him. Please don't be the people. Tip him good. Well, what if they do bad? Tip him good. Aren't you glad? Come on, aren't you glad that God doesn't tip? He doesn't tip us the way that we act sometimes. Where's my organ at? We have dun 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 dun. 
All right, let's move on. Keep your money. Number three, and I'm just helping talking a little bit. That helps break the ice a little bit. You know, it keeps, helps that. Helps a little medicine go down. Number three, you got a mission. Keep your money on mission. What do you mean? Keep your money on mission. Listen, you always have to. You always have to see purpose in your giving or you'll stop. 1 Corinthians 9, let each man give. It's a it's huge scripture. Let each person, let each person give. No one is exempt from giving. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly, not because you have to. Not because, no, no, not grudge, not of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. He said, you know, that, that's what he said. let each one give as he purposes. You've got to keep purpose in your giving. You got to see your money on mission. You got to see your money going. You got to get keep visualization that we're building the kingdom of God. Man, that's that's a, that person that comes to the altar. That's a part of that's a, that's a part of my giving. I I provided a place for that. I provided a facility. The worship team up here. They did a great job. You guys done today. Just a great job. Just so much liberty. It's great. Thank you. You are amazing. You guys are amazing. But, I, but, but that, that, that tar costs money. And that guitar costs money. And that rolling piano right there costs money. People just don't come and give it to us. Here, I'm going to give you this. No, it comes from the, the finances of this church. Keep your money on mission. Your giving makes a difference. You say, well, I just give a little. I know a guy, I know a little boy. The Bible talks about a little boy. He had five loaves and what? Two fish. And it made a difference. Quit weighing it out. Well, I don't have this much money. Be a giver. And God will multiply it. God will multiply it. Put God to the test, church. Use your faith. Put God to the test. Mission. I don't have time. You can write this down for later. You're not going there. But 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 13. Read it all. Because the Bible talks about how when you and I give, people can be awakened to the glory of God by our giving. Yeah. That thanksgiving to God will be given by others because someone was obedient yeah. to give. Yeah. Read it. You can do it later. Number four is stewardship. These are the considering the money ways. It's all about stewardship. What is a steward? Someone that manages someone's property and finances. It's a manager. Managing something that doesn't belong to you. I want you to write this down. We are stewards, not owners. And this is where generosity starts. It's a heart of thankfulness for what God has done for us. That's how generosity starts. And when I see it doesn't belong to me, it belongs to him. Giving is no big deal. I'm just going to steward What's your pastor? What do I got to do? Listen, you got it. Listen, I don't have time to go in this. God gives you a job. He gives you a job. How many know that's a blessing? Your job's a blessing. God's anointed you with gifts and talents and abilities to be able to do. He's given you the strength to be able to do it. It's a blessing. Quit seeing your job as a curse and start seeing it as a blessing. It's a way for God to provide for you a wage, right, that your needs can be met. Right? That you would, have, you would have something to give and be able to do something bigger than yourself. Right? God gives you these things for a reason. It all belongs to Him. It's stewardship. Can I get an amen here? It, it, it belongs to Him. That's what a steward says. It belongs to Him. And God gives you this wage, and that way you'll meet needs. Well, what do I do? You've got bills to pay. Amen, Pastor Paul. I got bills to pay. I get it. You're responsible to pay your bills. Hello? Amen. On time. Yeah. yeah, it's a part of excellence in the kingdom. But the problem is we keep getting ourselves in deeper debt. That way we have nothing to give. Before you say yes to something, you have to say no to something else. Don't let your finances... Be released because of pleasures and things that really you're not going to take with you.
God asks us to steward what he owns. We, we don't see ourselves, when we see ourselves as stewards, not owners, it changes the way we view. When we see ourselves as stewards, not owners, it changes the way we view our lives. If we don't see it right, we get anxious over money, we get fearful over money, we get greedy over money, we get moody over money. How many people are living in financial stress every single day? And listen, many times it's not God. It's your own choice. Well, it's not God at all causing stress. But it's because we keep putting ourselves in situations. And it's actually keeping us from being the giver and expressing the image of God in the earth, which is a part of our stewardship. Well, that went over real good. Praise the Lord. Stewardship. Stewardship requires this. Real quick. Keep a right perspective. Keep a right perspective. Stewardship requires us to keep a right perspective. Right? Every good and every perfect gift comes from above. We've been talking about that. I'll give you a scripture. A set of scriptures. I was in them yesterday again in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 18 and through 20. It's amazing set of scriptures. Might as well just read it to you. She put it up there. She prompted me. So I've got to read it now. Or if not, I'll let her down. And you shall remember. Now you go back and read this. The Bible says they were living in there. He said, don't, don't forget. God blessed them. You can go back and read it. It's awesome. He said, I, I, God blessed them. He said, and you shall remember the Lord your God. For it's he who gives you the power to get wealth. That he may establish his what? Why is, why is, he, establishing, why is he giving you wealth? To establish his covenant in the earth. Which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Verse 19. Then it shall be if if you by any means forget the Lord your God. And follow after gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. As the nation which the Lord destroys before you shall perish. Because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. Don't let your finances perish. Because you forget God in the middle of your life. Right perspective. Keep it right perspective. I have a lot to say, but I can't do there. Number two, make right investments. Make right investments. You can recognize God owns it all, but we still have to be good managers. Are you making right right investments with your finances? You say, man, you know what? Before you go, listen, I'm just being honest with you. Can I just be honest with your pastor? Come on now. Listen, if you you happen to buy, I don't want to go here. Let's just say, let's. Buy whatever. And you know it's going to put you in a bind from being able to pay your tithes and to give offerings to the Lord. Why would you put yourself in that? You need to consider your ways. I'm not doing this for my sake. I'm doing this for yours. There's a right investment. Are you able to give to a cause, a missionary, an offering for special need? Are you able to help somebody uh, that's having a problem that you work with? This is the deal. The tithe helps us to manage the 90. If we can't live on the 90, we need to pause and think about whether we are doing things we should not be doing with our finances as a family. And there's a right reward. This is the last thing on that one. So the stewardship, keep a right perspective, make a right investment. And I want you to understand there's a right reward. Stewards get paid. Nothing wrong with that. God's not against blessing you and helping you advance. Look what he says here in 2 Corinthians 9. And whoever, Jess, you want to come? 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Verses 6 through 8. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will reap also sparingly. But he who sows bountifully will also what? Reap bountifully. So let. Let's a permissive word. So it means you have to let this, you've got to give it permission. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudging over necessity, for God loves a what? A cheerful giver. And God. That's the conjunction, right? Sowing little, sowing much, getting that right, giving without with a cheerful heart and conjunction connects it. And God yeah. is able to take that obedience and He releases grace towards you. 
to make all grace abound to you. God's supernatural influence starts working in your finances. That you always having all sufficiency in all things, all your needs being met. May have abundance for what? He said your need will be met and you'll have something to be able to do and to give. Because the goal was to be like the giver. to be For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. We're becoming like him the more we're giving. We're breaking selfish out of our life, which is the root of all evil. That way I can walk and follow Jesus to my fullest potential. Having all sufficient in all things, may it have abundance for every what? Good work. R.G. Letourneau, he invented the earth moving machines. He gave away 90% of his income. This is what he said. R.G. Letourneau, you can look him up, not now. The money came in faster than he could give it, give it away, Letourneau said. I shovel it out, and God shovels it back. But God has a bigger shovel. All he's needing is our obedience. That's all he needs. This, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is the money message, right? We do it every year. I'm not talking about next week. But this is an important message. God wants to help you. He wants to help you. He wants us to take care of things and take care of his church. Take care of his church. Right? Take care of his church. If I, if I, if I done this, and this is where we're close, but if I had three guys in this room, three guys, three guys, stand, stand up. Stand up, Jocelyn and, and Chris and and, and stand up, somebody. Stand up. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. And I said to you, hey, listen, it's my wife. It's my wife here, right? Miss Sandy. You guys know her. She's a good-looking chick. I love her, man. <laughs> we went to a wedding yesterday, and I told, I told Nora, I was sitting there, I said, man, your mama is the best-looking thing ever. <laughs> Didn't I not say that? <laughs> but I'm going away. I'm going to be gone. And I said, listen, Chris, I'm going to give you $5,000. I'm going to give you $5,000. And I'm going to give you $5,000. And I want you to take care of my wife for me. Because I'm going away. So all of a sudden, you know, I call Andy up a few, few months later. How's things going? Well, you know, you've been giving me, you know, uh, $500 a, a month. $500. Giving a tithe to my wife. Helping her. Five hundred. He's been faithful. This guy right here, he's been sending a thousand dollars a month, thousand dollars. But Justin, not Justin, but <laughs> sorry, I get it, I get it. But this guy, what I'm gonna say, this guy, he's just a representation. Well, he, you know, he sent me five hundred dollars one month. The next month, he sent two fifty, but I haven't seen anything from him for a while. Now, let me ask you a question. What is that speaking to me about what I've asked him to do? He's not taking care of, he's not taking care of her. Thank you, guys. He, he, he's not taking care of her, which would mean this. He doesn't really care. Do you see the parallel? Do you see the parallel? How do you think that would make me feel? Hurt? Not interested in taking care of my wife? I'm, I'm away. I can't. I need, I need, need somebody to help her. Just wanting 10%. Just want 10% to go to, to her, to help her. And you can have the 90. You, you can have the 90. It's also saying that maybe you can't be trusted. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question.
me ask you a question. So if I'm giving money out, $5,000 a month, I hope that's right. <laughs> Do you think I'm going to send you any more money? I can't trust him. I can't trust him. Maybe God takes our giving a little more serious than what we think. He wants us to take care of his wife, the church, to do what we need to do to make sure she's taken care of. And listen, if God can get it through you, He'll get it to you. If God can get it through you, He'll open it up. It may not always come back in dollar and cents, but it comes back in dollar and cents. All of a sudden, this starts to happen. And that doesn't break down like it always has. And that lasts a little longer. Right? You guys all right? I'm done. So, making change. God and money and you. Consider your ways. Just consider your ways. God's going to take good care of you. Thank you so much for being faithful in your giving in this church. You guys are amazing. Amazing. Just keep doing what we do. Let's meet the need. So, Pastor Paul, I know what some of you may be saying. I don't have any money to give. Let me tell you what you need to do. Start right where you're at. Give a mint. One time, someone put a joint in, and I did came. Sunday, Monday was, what do you want to do with this? Well, I don't know. We're not going to keep it here. <laughs> Promise you. Promise you. It happened. Did it not, Marianne? It happened. We didn't smoke it. Inside. <laughs> but someone was giving something. I don't know what they were trying to get rid of, but they're getting rid of it, right? This is the deal. You say, well, Pastor Paul, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm deep in debt. All right, I get it. I get you. I get you. What do I need to do? Start somewhere. This is not, in the New Testament, it's not a have to. It's I get to. Right? It's a get to. So that's the difference between Old Testament and New Testament. Again, I don't have time to go down that road. But this is the difference. I get to do this. You say, well, Pastor Paul, maybe you need to look at your finances. Get a look, square some things up. Say no to some stuff. Eat a bologna sandwich. Praise God, invite me over too. Fried bologna. Traeger bologna. Yeah. Hold on. Come here. I was sitting over where Terry was. Um, years, many years ago, and uh, uh, man, I was going through some bad times financially. And the only reason I bring it up about finances is is because there was a guy sitting right here, and I was just had my heads in my hands. And I've told this testimony before, but I'm telling it again. That's all right. And uh, but I sat over where Terry was sitting at, and and I had my hands in my head, and I was just I was broke, busted, and disgusted. And uh, I was sitting there, and I said, "Lord, I just I, I need I need some money. I need some, I just just say what you mean, mean what you say." I said, "I need some money." I said, "I need I need seven hundred dollars, man. I need it right now. I need it now. I need it." And uh, what did I say? This guy was sitting over here. Tim, he was sitting over here. Now I knew him in church, but I didn't know him. I just knew he went here. And uh, like I was struggling over here, and he was struggling over here. And that day, we both met the Lord. Because he come to me, he said, hey, man, I don't know you that well. He said, but the Lord told me that I need to give you $700. I said, what, buddy? You know, so my gratitude would be this. Say, you know, I take the money and stuff. You know what I told him? I said, now this is where pride come in. I said, I don't want your money. He said, you don't understand. <laughs> he said, I don't want to give it to you. <laughs> And he said, but the Lord, he said, but the Lord said to give it to you. So that day, it broke off in two men's life, selfishness. And, and, and basically what I said, it broke off selfishness, but it blessed us both. 
So blessed you both. It blessed us both. God just needed obedience. That's right. And when you was talking about it, it just brought back, you know, I just remember sitting over, I said, my gosh, God's doing the work, you know, but it's, it's, it's good. Amen. It's good. Amen. It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Stand to your feet. Yeah, praise the Lord. God's good, church. All the time and all the time what? God's good. And I want you to realize that, man. I hope you hear my heart. I'm not preaching this message because I'm trying to get you just to give all your money. I want, I want God to provide for you. I want him to do something great in your life. I want him. I'm teaching you principles, biblical principles of giving. So I don't know where I'm going to start. Start with a dollar. Believe God to increase you. He knows your heart. He sees your heart. You give that way. I promise you. So, well, where do I start? God's given us a starting point, the tenth. That's a good place to start. If you're not there yet, you're going to give five. Give five right now, but believe God to get you to the tenth. That's where that's the ceiling or the the floor level. It's not the ceiling of giving in the New Testament. It's the it's the floor level. It's the entrance level. He's giving you where to start. God's testing our heart. Will you believe Him? Will you trust Him with your finances? Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much that Lord today in this room that these givers, Lord, I know this church, I see these people, what we've done here, God, and what you've done through this place, God, through these faithful giving and faithful giver, the giving of faith, uh, uh, these faithful people to do what you've called them and told them to do. Lord, we thank you so much for it. Lord, today I pray that we would all be stirred to get, into part, get a part of God's economy, that we would get a part of what you are doing, God. This world, Lord God, this, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the financial structure of the, our society, Lord, is shaky, shaky, shaky. But Lord God, your kingdom, we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Hallelujah. So Lord, you provided, hallelujah, you provided all down through history. We read about Abraham. We read about Isaac. We read about Jacob. We read about, Lord God, all these things in the Old Testament. We see, Lord God, that Paul said that we are to give, uh, give, Lord God, generously and give, Lord God, with radical generosity and obedience, Lord God, to what you've told us to do. And Lord, we're going to do that. We're going to be people that's expressing the image of God in the earth, the earth, the, 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 pe- the, the people of God being givers. Lord, what would it look like if the church in America would step up and begin to do what you've called them to do? Lord, there'll be nothing, there'll be nothing, Lord God, that could be standing in our way as far as in the world to be able to do what we need to do, to, to rent out stadiums, or Lord God, to, to, to feed the poor, to, to, to build orphanages, to, to build, Lord God, to send money by the, by, the, by the millions to Haiti and to help, Lord God. What could we do, Lord God? Hallelujah, to get the gospel to people. Help us to dream, because we're going there. We're going there. Thank you so much for what you're doing, Lord. You know, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, if you've never accepted Christ today, you say, well, how is this?